Thanks for listening to CarCast on Podcast One. Hey guys, we've got uh, an episode of a uh, fun episode of CarCast. We've got Alistair Weaver coming on the show to tell us all about his epic EV range test that's going on. But before we get started, I want to tell you about our friends at Meguiar's. You know, Meguiar's has come a long way with uh, with their car waxes over the years, and they've launched their next generation of protective products with their hybrid ceramic platform that's really specifically toward the, the DIYers like you guys. It all started about two years ago when Meguiar's introduced their hybrid ceramic spray wax. Its advanced SiO2 hybrid technology delivers wax protection and durability beyond traditional wax. There's no real buffing or curing or, 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 or a mess. Uh, it's a great product. And uh, then a year later, they came out with their more uh, traditional uh, application. It's the, it's the Meguiar's Hybrid Ceramic Liquid Wax. This, again, is long-lasting ceramic protection that's easy to use like a wax. And then, of course, they just released their uh, their hybrid ceramic spray detailer. This is for in between when you want to get that boosted maintenance. It also contains their SiO2 hybrid ceramic protection. And then introduced this year is Meguiar's new hybrid ceramic wash and wax. This is a unique two liquid system in one bucket that uh, you just apply, you just wash, and uh, and and it goes on. It's got their SiO2 boost. Uh, as well, it's a wax additive that delivers an instant water beating protection. So now Meguiar's has a ceramic hybrid solution for everyone for incredible water beating protection and durability beyond traditional wax. It's ceramic made easy. It's Meguiar's. <laughs> Welcome to CarCast. I'm Matt, the moderator, D'Andrea, with Bill Goldberg dancing around. Got Loving some those... concrete going in next month. Oh, <laughs> man, the garage, the garage. That's fantastic. Uh, as long as it doesn't blow away or freeze or melt, and you never know. Does it get too hot? It gets too cold, too windy. Or get picked up in a, in a tornado. A tornado or just something is going on. Earthquake. Uh, yeah. uh, of course, we've got Alistair Weaver from Edmunds.com joining us again. How are you? Good. Good morning, gentlemen. Alistair has been the hot topic on social media recently. We're going to get into that a little bit. (laughs) Um, uh, I don't know how much we're going to get into the uh, Barrett Jackson stuff on this episode. I think we'll get into it later this week uh, with with Adam. But uh, yes, went to Barrett Jackson. Just a quick little overview of of that event. Um, You know, attendance was was down a lot. By design, right, with COVID rules and also the change from January to March. Um, You know, keep in mind that uh, Arizona does auction week. So RM and Gooding and and Russo and all these auctions are normally out there. So tons and tons of people come into town and and tour all of the auctions. None of that happened. This was just a Barrett Jackson auction. Uh, It was nice on Saturday, their Super Saturday, to see, to definitely see some people there. Uh, walking around, and then out in the f- out in the field where the tents are, they line up cars and cars and cars. The cars were socially distanced. It was a car, and then a space, and then a car, and then a space. So where where in the past they would do somewhere around two thousand cars over the course of the week, they auctioned off half. They had about a thousand cars, which is amazing. Was the prices of these cars? Uh, uh, the last big auction they had, 2,000 cars, $145 million in sales. This year, 1,000 cars, $105 million in sales. Like, I mean, obviously you can't call it averages, but the averages jump from somewhere around $74,000 per car to $100,000 per car. Uh, it was just amazing to see, uh, uh, Bill, your, uh, your little your little buddy Kevin Hart was out there buying up cars and with his and crew. I, I heard somebody so or I yeah I saw the yes he so, so he's got a show coming out on on Motor Trend I think 
uh, and he's got his car crew, the Plastic Cup Boys <laughs> is the name of the crew. And they were all there. They were standing on the tables, and Kevin Hart was buying a car. He bought uh, – he was buying hot rods. He was buying, like, resto mods, like, well done – you know, like early model Corvettes, fifty nine, sixty Corvettes. You know, with with like Art Morrison or Roadster shop shop chassis in it. Just you know, crate engine just done up really nice, but not number matching originals. He spent three hundred fifty thousand dollars on one really nice hot rod, and then I don't know who bid him against him on this other car that mint one, but seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars he paid for (laughs) for a hot rod. Listen, it was a nice car. I don't. It's not seven hundred fifty thousand dollars car. Oh my god! Here, here's the thing: is Kevin Hart was very happy with the purchase. He got the car that he wanted. So and he's got plenty of money, so no harm, no foul there. And the seller just had the greatest day of his life because he thought maybe on a good day he'd get three hundred grand for that car, and he got seven fifty. <laughs> so custom cars, man, they're they're worth I, what anybody will pay for. I am telling just you, like any other car, but you know, uh, you know as long as everybody's happy. I, you know Craig's happy. Craig is happy, <laughs> as he should be. <laughs> uh, you know, for whatever they lost in ticket sales, they made up for in car sales. Um, but I'll tell you, not everything went for crazy money, right? Okay, that's what I want to ask you. Yeah. By being there in person, what was the segment that wasn't bringing the money? There, there were a few like numbers matching muscle cars that that went under the radar. They either went earlier yeah. in the week, Saturday when they had their prime time cars, it was great, and then when the prime time cars were done and it was going into the later hours of the night, uh, those cars started to reduce in in price and kind of toward the end like the last i don't know five or ten cars there was a copo camaro there was like a 68 copo camaro and i i want to say the hammer was like 175 thousand bucks it was way under 125 less than what i sold mine for a couple years yeah it was wasn't even a ferret so way under yeah, it was uh, that one slipped under the radar, uh, and uh, Brad Fanshaw, my my co-host on Shift and Steer, uh, big fans of that car. We waited. We were one of the last people there. We waited for that car to go because we just wanted to see if it was going to pull the money. It was a phone bidder or something, and it kind of snuck under the radar. But I wish you would have called me. But to give you some modern day perspective. Um, four GTs, the 2005, 2006 GTs. We see them all day long at auction and bring a trailer pulling 280, 285, 290. They were all going for over 300,000. That's hammer price. So you're adding another $30,000 on top of that. I think one of them went for like $440,000 all in. And a, and a modern GT, Alistair, that you've driven, I've driven, Bill, yeah. you've driven, over a million dollars those cars are getting. So if you were on the list and you were able to get one of those, they're they're selling yeah they're they're selling for a million dollars and I'm not even talking about the heritage edition like the red with the white you know those are one two one three you know so uh um you know it's again, a com- just, I mean you were you were there but it's a combination of a lot of things right yes yes it was you know, and listen perfect storm for a lot of people I mean the next one may not be reminiscent of what just happened because of so many different factors in the in the next three months probably but. It, it, it was some. It was a sight to behold, and I wish I was there like you were to see. Yeah, I wish I was there with with a wallet full of money because well, yeah, uh, there's a bad. few things. Yeah, it, it, it may be a bad time to buy, though, Matt. To be honest, I know money's you know if you're borrowing money, money's pretty cheap. But I don't know. There's a lot. It's a bit like housing market. The, people but the people that were buying, the people that were buying, didn't make it. From what I could see, from what I got my pulse on, they're not buying for a profit. They're not buying for investment right now. It, it seemed to me to be much more of the show, what we used to remember Barrett Jackson yeah. being, even with a limited amount of people, but that's what people just want to get at. It's like after the, you know, the roaring twenties or whatever, right? yeah. the, the, the boom, you know, people are tired of being inside. They want to go out and they want to spend, you know, they want to have a good time. They want to put a smile on their face. And there's a well, lot of contributing factors to what just happened. Yeah. We, we certainly had a good time out there, and uh, it was a fun event as always. And uh, it, was, it was still a chance to go out and a bunch of meetings, a bunch of meet up. Met up with our buddy Steve from Metron Garage, and uh, we walked the the salon collection together, and uh, and met up with our guys at Levrack and uh, 
uh, we all took a bunch of funny, funny <laughs> pictures with you with the car capsule. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and by the way, everybody was there uh, uh, taking pictures with the, you in the car capsule, the big giant cardboard cutout of you in the I car capsule. I can only imagine what the lewd acts were the, towards my cardboard because I wasn't there to defend me. The funny thing is, is, is they also had a cardboard cutout in the same car capsule of Wayne Carini, and Carini. They, but they literally like made them to scale. Carini was so tiny, and you were so big in the car capsule. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it was fun to see. Um, one, one quick little uh, story. So, uh, a bunch of the cars there were being sold by a guy named Larry Winkler. Larry Winkler sold like his entire collection. He said, and, and this wasn't. Him going, hey, I'm going to start getting into airplanes or mega yachts or I, I'm not feeling well and I'm, I'm dying soon. It was none of that. He just spent a lifetime buying cars and, and neon signs and gas pumps and everything. And he literally just decided to reboot his entire collection. So he sold everything, everything he had. And a guy, a guy I guess from the East Coast or something, had a... A, a a a new 4 GT like a 2018 4 GT by the way i you would love it bill it was all black stripe delete it was just the darth vader it. yeah darth yeah. vader of cars beautiful the guy figured he was going to get good money for it and sell it cuz it's no reserve he bought an enclosed trailer a brand new enclosed trailer put the car in there towed it out here and when he got here he said by the way the trailer's included because i don't want to take it home it still had paper plates on it he's like he basically spent thirty thousand dollars on a trailer to just include it in the price and uh that guy larry winkler sold all of his cars and he bought that four gt for just over a million bucks nice and he, and he went outside and brad fanshaw was out there and he goes, hey, I got this Ford GT. It's the first car in my new collection. He goes, and I got a tr- car trailer. I don't know what to do with it. I don't have any more cars. I just got one car. So I got a car trailer. I don't know what to do with it. So this is. I was there again. Yeah, he was. He was actually upset. He got a free trailer out of the deal, but uh, uh, I'm sure he'll be fine because, for, uh, what I understand, he's got a massive warehouse with just empty now. Uh, yeah. Everything, won't every for, neon sign. Remember, oh my gosh! Remember, yeah. remember Milt Robson in Georgia that sold his entire collection? Yeah, you know, and then boom! Immediately six months afterwards, oh, I'm only going to have ten cars and now. It turns to twenty and thirty again. So I mean, it's a reboot. It, 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 my neighbor's doing it right down the street. Fifty-seven cars in New Orleans, and he's now he's down to ten. So <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it won't last long. Yeah, Alistair's next. He's he's in the same playing field. As what well, big car collection, <laughs> I would love it. You guys, I, I, wait, I don't want to hear it from either one of you because you get to drive the coolest cars in the world. Yeah, period. that is true. I can't touch that, right? The big, big, my biggest no, car I have collection. I a couple of cool cars, but I don't get to drive every brand new cool <laughs> badass car on the market. That's I'm very envious. Of that. Yeah, the press office is the best car collection. Yeah, right. So then you don't have to maintain it. But um, bingo. No, joke aside, it, the weirdest one I ever went to was in was in London. Was an RM auctions in in London before they merged with Sotheby's, and uh, that was Bernie Eccleston's private collection. And he had all sorts of weird stuff. He had like old American cop cars and all sorts of stuff. And they were all there. A lot of it was stored under a, an airfield in in South London. And then Bernie hmm. was selling off his collection. That was a that was quite a weird evening. How did it go? Was, was it well received? Were the vehicles well received over there? Good money. I think so. Yeah, I think I, I mean this is going back a few years, but yeah, he had all sorts of old. He also had some epic uh, old Formula One cars, which weren't included in the collection. I mean, he he had got a lot of stuff that nobody ever knew he'd got and was hidden away, and you know, pretty eccentric individual. And they were all hidden away under an airfield in in South London, hmm. uh, a place called Bigger Hill. So yeah, that that was a cool evening. Nice. All right, Alistair, we're going to get into a few things. Um, uh, uh, before we get started, just a word from our friends at Dodge. You know, Dodge was ranked number one for initial quality and best driver appeal for mass market brands by J.D. Power. It's the first U.S. brand ever to be ranked number one in initial quality and appeal in the same year. So see your local Dodge dealer or visit Dodge.com today to schedule a test drive. Um, all right. So uh, I was going to save this for later, but breaking news. 
my Mustang Cobra that's been on the lift in Adam's garage has been moved. It is in the car trailer and it is heading over to my warehouse. It's uh, It's been there uh, when I parked it there in the end of November in 2016. 2016. <laughs> 2016. <laughs> it's, uh, there is a, a, a car-shaped dust outline underneath, uh, underneath the Good lift. Good for you, man. It's, uh, it's all loaded up and uh, it's moving over. Um, getting some uh, getting some tools outfitted and be able to uh, to get that thing uh, going. It'll be my motivation now to uh, to get that worked on. But the place looks weird without it sitting there. But uh, anyway, more on that later. Alistair, you were last time you were on. You talked about uh, doing some EV testing, saying Porsche did well, Mustang Mach E. You guys really like. Uh, Tesla, although a vehicle you guys like and you own personally, uh, or your wife leases one and you use it all the time for testing purposes, <laughs> something along the lines of that. Yeah, with the mo miles light one. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and their 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 range results, I guess, were underperformed. And uh, Tesla made a fuss and called you and and try to be your BFF for a minute and. Uh, and you said, hey, we will do a new test. We will do the most epic EV range test ever devised by human. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, the results ended in controversy. Yeah, that's a, that's a, reasonable, that's a reasonable summary, Matt. The, <laughs> the, end of the, the results ended up with people making gifs about me on Twitter. So uh, we just, we just, you I made it. Had that, but, but uh, that was oh. a first for me. So, so tell us, give us the story. Back up a little bit and and tell us yeah. how this this kind of came to be. So, the background of all of this is we've started range testing every EV. So we drive it on a real world loop in Southern California, um, and this is meant to be an approximation for what you might expect in the real world. With you know, with caveats that it's Southern California, we're driving you know conservatively sticking speed limits not using you know vigorous acceleration that kind of thing but we think it's a sensible approximation of what you might 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 expect and it threw up some really interesting results the mccann overperformed uh, sorry mccann the tycan 4s overperformed by about 60 percent, and this is relative to its epa official figures um and tesla was unique apart well tesla and polestar were the only ones who didn't hit their epa figures in our in our tests so, and this is what we talked about last time I was on the show. And then Tesla called me up um, and said, look, we want a meeting with our battery engineers and, and every, everything else. And you may remember that Tesla doesn't have a press office anymore, but this was this was talking directly with the with the engineers. And they basically argued that if you get to the end of the, well, an indicated zero on the computer is not a true zero. And there is a safety buffer beyond zero. And if you add that buffer, then they would hit the EPA figures and all would be well with the world. <laughs> so, and could we please change the article based, based on this knowledge? So we kind of said, well, that's really interesting. And, you know, there's uh, realistically, we need to, you know, we need to test this now. So we went off to Honda has a proving ground in the Mojave, which you can hire. Uh, so we got the checkbook out, went and hired a, a proving ground. We did that because we wanted to gather together a bunch of EVs and effectively run them until they stop. And doing that on the public road just wasn't wasn't very practical. <laughs> and to be honest, we weren't interested in 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 safe, I should say. And and we we weren't interested in the range that we get down to zero. We we're only interested in this bit after zero. So we got everything together on a seven and a half mile oval. We had a Tesla that Tesla supply, supplied, Model Three Long Range. We had a two Teslas that we own. One of which, quite right, Matt is my wife's. <laughs> uh, we then had uh, a Mackie, a Ford. And a, a Mac e Bill, Thank a Mac e Bill uh, and a Volkswagen ID4. And we, we basically started them all with, we, we were, I mean, if you watch the video, if you go to edmunds.com slash Tesla challenge, you can read all about it. And there's a video as well. And our engineering team, our test team, we're all engineer, led by engineers and is ultra fastidious. So we charged these things overnight. We drove them all at 65 miles an hour. We had race logic come down and fit V boxes. So everything was GPS tracked all in the same conditions, 30 seconds apart to manage things like aerodynamics. And then we drove them all down to zero and then basically measured what happens after an indicator zero. 
So basically then how long would they sustain 65 miles an hour before they drop off as a view of you know, how long would you be, be safe on the highway? And then basically how much range could you eke out from there before you stop? The idea being to test this idea that that you know that that Tesla has this this big range built in. So we got the we got the results. Went back to the office, you know, or virtual office if you like, and and crunched the numbers. So the Mustang Mackey, Mackey Bill went five point <laughs> eight miles uh, at sixty five miles an hour, seven point three miles total. Model Y performance twelve point six miles. ID these, four, these are after point. zero. These are after yeah, zero. This is, so. this is after zero. Okay. So this is after an indicated zero. So this is basically to it literally breaks down on the side of the track. Okay. So Model Y 12.6, ID4 12.9, Model 3 standard range plus 17.6, then long range 25.9. So all the spread from 7.3 miles for the four <laughs> to 25.9 for, for the Model 3 that, that Tesla was supplied. They literally built the car the week before. The Talk about the, ty- the Taycan. Where did that fall? We didn't manage to get a Taycan, unfortunately. We did try, uh, but Tesla, but sorry, Tesla Porsche basically just didn't have one that we could we could lay our hands on for this purpose, which was a shame. But we can always go back and do that. So this was interesting itself, and then we wanted to do a control that said, okay, what does this look like in the real world? So we took the Model Y performance that we own and the Model Three long range that Tesla provided, and went back out onto the onto the real world, uh, onto and did our range loop again. And actually, they went less far than they did on the proving ground. So the Model Y went 11.1 miles. The Model 3 long range went 17.3 miles. And this was running them to stop on, a, you know, on, on, on public roads. So it's a really fascinating result. Um, and when you add all that together, you, know, you realize that actually of the six Teslas that we have tested, even if you add, even if you add this buffer, such as it is, then two of the six still don't hit their EPA figures. And what we're saying is to consumers, and this is the bit that's got so controversial, is, is you would be crazy to run your EV beyond an indicated zero because not only do you not know what that buffer is, and we proved that that, that buffer is variable, but also you know it gets into battery degradation, problems recharging, everything else, and also you're going to be stranded. So we run our test to a, an indicated zero, and we think that's a sensible measure. So we're not going to add any buffer to any of our tests because what we're trying to do is, is say, this is a real world, guys. So obviously we published all this and, you know, everything's um, everything's kicked off from there. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, I, I, I understand uh, Tesla's point or anybody, any car manufacturer's point saying there is buffer beyond zero. Um which you would expect some um, some amount of safety margin, something, right? Say with a gas car, right? I mean, it's yeah. always been there. Yeah, you know, we've all probably been in that panic exactly. and hit zero. And yeah, I mean, I mean, would you? It it seems a little irresponsible for any of the car manufacturers to reach out to you and say, "Hey, during your test, you should include and publish in your article." How many miles beyond zero? Because now you're literally encouraging everybody to go beyond zero. But even uh, taking that into was... consideration, they're still full of shit. <laughs> right? Well, the argument was with the EPA that the EPA goes effectively goes beyond zero because it's measuring battery. It, 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 measure, it effectively measures beyond zero the way that they do their tests. So that was the whole point really but that you know actually the epa does this so you should do this and then it would then actually you're equating one with the other because we're saying but what we, we were saying and this is the bit that i think a lot of the the tesla fanboys have, have, have sort of missed we weren't saying it doesn't hit the epa rating this is some sort of scientific what we're not saying this is a sort of uh we're not we're not trying to kind of comment on the pure science we're actually trying to comment on the real the real world reality and when people hear the epa figure they don't say they don't think. Oh, that must include a safety buffer. No, I don't think any consumer would have believed that the EPA figure would include this this buffer beyond zero. So what we're trying to do is say, if you think of the EPA as a real world measure, I I, I went on a Tesla Daily podcast and was talking about this. And you know, if you're buying one of these cars to drive to Auntie Annie, and it's uh, the EPA says it'll do 220 miles, then if Auntie Annie lives 210 miles away, you think you're going to get there. But the reality is, you know, there's so many other factors. And our, our range testing 
if you took the Tesla, you probably, you know, the Tesla tends to underperform EPA, whereas pretty much everybody else overperforms EPA. And sometimes in the case of the Taycan, dramatically so. So all we're doing is giving you another measure. We're not saying it's a perfect test. We're not saying it's applicable if you're, you know, directly applicable if you live in Michigan or in Texas, uh, you know, or wherever it may be. But what we are saying is this is another really important measure to understand how far these cars will go. I think you guys went to very, very long, impartial lengths to, to try to prove them correct also. And they should that's see that's that as opposed to it being impartial, like they're making it out to be seemingly. I, it, yeah, it's not. There was no. I mean, this is a kind of also perverse thing about it. You know, we say in the video and we've said time and again, you know, the Model 3 is our Edmunds top rated EV. We love the product. I bought the product. You know, there's nothing, it's not that we're saying, and, the, you know, it's it, to any ma- any manufacturer, it's not that we're saying this makes Tesla a bad vehicle. We're not even saying this means that the Tesla range isn't sufficient for your daily needs. All we're saying is relative to the other manufacturers or the other EVs we've tested in these conditions, in our standard loop, this is this is how the Tesla performed, and this is how the you know, how the others performed. And there's a lot of fuss being made about temperature and everything else. And obviously we can't drive a hundred vehicles on the same day. Um, but if you look at the Mach-E temperature, the Mach-E was basically done at the same temperature as the, as, as the Tesla's about 61 degrees. So, you know, the Taycan was a bit hotter, which tends to give you a bit more range, but, you know, and also people, batteries, cars manage their battery temperatures in a different way these days. Porsche's system, Audi systems, different to the way Tesla does it, things like that. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuances, but it is extraordinary the, the kind of vitriol that you the, the vitriolic reaction that, that you get on, on Twitter and everything else. It's uh yeah, it's yeah, extraordinary world out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Um so uh, backing up a little bit, when you guys test EVs normally or any car just for gas mileage or EV range, th- the the sort of real world loop that you guys normally did, which sparked the controversy to begin with with Tesla, right? Now that you did this this more in depth sort of epic version of the test, did you find a, a difference between your initial loop and this one? Where is there any truth behind? Hey, maybe your loop is accurate or was inaccurate in, in any in any way. So, so here, here's the fact. It's also been second version. We, when we re-ran, so we ran the original Model Y performance range thing back in November, I think it was November December, and then we re-ran it as part of this control for real world, and we actually got exactly the same range figure. Now, you know, mm-hmm. you know which you know, given the different day, slightly different temperature, you might have expected a handful of miles different, but it was really interesting. We got the same range figure, which suggests that we, you know. It's it's we you know we 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 feel that our our methodology is valid. We've had a lot of very positive response from the scientific community. You know we are led by by engineers, and we've had a, a really positive response from you know from from those in the know, if you like. And again, we're not we're, nobody's trying to say this is absolutely perfect. No test is perfect, but you know if you have an EPA test which is sixty percent different to what you might imagine in the real world, then there's a bit of an issue there. And the Taycan's a special case because it has a gearbox and things like that. But you know at the moment there's all sorts of reasons. The, the EPA has two different ways of testing. People self-certify, so a lot of this is about making a call on how aggressive you want to be with your figures. So there's an awful lot that the consumer would never even imagine goes on to create these to create these numbers. There's definitely more to come on from us. And the big thing is, you know, this is a this is a big commitment. I mean, if you go in the Model 3 long range is now the long, furthest, you know, furthest car we've tested. And, you know, it's good news. And that did 345 miles, you know. So guys in the office are literally driving all day uh, in order to complete these tests. So, you know, you really need fairly consistent, you know, as consistent as possible weather conditions, i.e. Southern California, access to the vehicles and the resource to do this. So we do feel that we're in a, a positive place and, you know, we need to double down on this. I think it's really important for it's really important consumer information. Uh, I have a couple more questions. Let me just uh, hit this thing from Empire Covers, a new sponsor that we have. You know, nowadays cars are designed to keep you safe on the road, but are you providing the same protection for your car off the road? Empire Covers, they offer a high quality, affordable covers engineered to protect against rain, UV rays, tree sap, pollen, anything that damages your vehicle's paint. And for premium protection, 
Try the American Armor cover, proudly made in their their Kentucky factory. Plus, they have covers for RVs, boats, motorcycles, and more. You know, and all covers come with a free multi-year warranty. So if you want some free shipping plus an extra 15% off your order, use promo code CARCAST. Go to empirecovers.com slash CARCAST. Use the promo code CARCAST. That's empirecovers.com slash CARCAST. Promo code CARCAST. So protect what you love. Um, as you got into this and started testing these cars uh, a little bit more, did you – you know, the range thing is is one thing, but when do you start getting into – this is going to be some other epic test you guys are going to have to figure out if you're not already working on it – is the cost of charging. What is the efficiency of the vehicles, right? If you're – you know, is it gonna, does it cost X amount of dollars or kilowatts or some metric to plug it in and charge it one car versus another? Right. This is separate from cost of ownership, right? Maintenance and how does it go through brake pads and whatever, but just the cost of, of ownership in the sense of charging. Yeah, so this is this is a really interesting point, Matt. And if you go to pageedmonds.com slash range, this is where we have all this data. And actually at the moment everybody's fixated on range because it's it's just what you know what what sort of mainstream talks about. But actually, as, as EV adoption goes up, I think it's all going to pivot to efficiency, which is kind of miles per gallon by another speak. And actually, we measure that in kilowatt hours per 100 miles. And all of that is actually in our in our data as well. And I think as time goes on, that's going to become more and more important because at the moment, people sort of, you know, plug your car in at home or whatever and don't really think about it because you just pay the, you know, pay the electricity bill every month. Uh, whereas, whereas with gas, it's more of a direct transaction. I think that's going to change, you know, when people are just driving these all the time and start to realize how much the electricity bill has actually gone up. So that's going to become more and more important. But the other thing that, that we're really looking into, and this is where Tesla really scores at the moment, is the infrastructure for charging when you're out on a journey. Electrify America is, there's, there's, serious, there's serious problems with, you know, just how, well, how reliable the kit is, you know, how, where, where it's located. The whole thing, you know, we a Tesla supercharger, you turn up, you plug it in. It, I, I've never had problems with it not working. You know, they're well, they're well located. You can actually plan around it and, and rely on it. You know, when we went out and did this test, we're out in Mojave and we had all sorts of problems charging the ID4, the Volkswagen, because you basically got these what they call digital handshakes. So you plug it in and the car then has to connect with the system. The system then has to connect with the credit card and all this sort of software engineering goes on. And it's just not very reliable, and it's it's a poor experience. So that that's the biggest challenge for me to buying any EV that isn't that isn't a, that isn't a Tesla at the moment. You know, if you're a Taycan customer or Mackie, yes, people charge it at home. And so if all you're doing is 50, you know fifty miles, hundred miles a day or whatever, then there's no problem. You charge it at home. But if you're going to go out and road trip this, if you're going to go out to you know LA to Vegas or whatever it would be, you're going to be reliant on this charging infrastructure, and that's where things are, are starting to fall apart a little bit. It's a real race against time to get that infrastructure up and running. Yeah. It, you you spoke about that before as well, saying that Tesla really put a lot into the infrastructure and they're able to do that. Is there, is there ever going to be any sort of opportunity for people to charge other brands at Tesla stations? Like how come the aftermarket doesn't have like Tesla adapters at some point? Is Is it just more complicated than that? Because it's a software thing, there's no – with a Tesla, you literally just take the – you know, you take the cable and plug it into your car, and then the cable talks to your car. So there'd be no there'd be no back end to that. There'd be no way of connecting your car to the system and getting the flow, getting the charge to flow. So unless somebody wants to come along and give Elon, you know, billions of dollars to, to say, can we please, you know, borrow your supercharger network, it's impossible to see that happening. Yeah, I guess that's, that makes their sense. Trump, that's their Trump card at the moment. I don't ever see that app. Yeah, I mean, why would it? That's that's part of the value of that company is what they what yeah. they've built. So, arguably unless, the value. Yeah, yeah, unless there was a, a huge revenue model that made sense for them to do that, then I'm not sure why <laughs> why why they would do that. But uh, well, the test is interesting. Um, 
uh, do we do we know what's going to be the next step? What's the follow up? Well, first of all, what are some of the comments that you've been getting? <laughs> 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 like, wh- well, it, why do people are make why are people making a fuss about it? I think it, the, 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 well, they're, they're making a fuss about it because Tesla didn't come out well, uh, and there is this extraordinary kind of Elon's army of of internet com- you know commentators and people who really. <laughs> You know, also people who've built their career, built genuinely built careers around being, you know, Tesla, Tesla fanboys. Uh, so anything that runs, you know, that runs counter to that, counter to that image, and you know what it's like, Bill. It's the same in in, in your line of work. You know, all your nuance is lost. You know, yep. so the fact that you say, you know, I made a comment that there are a lot of factors associated with temperature, um, and there's also a lot of factors associated with efficiency and range. It's not, you know, that these correlations aren't as direct as you, you know, as a layman might think. And you know, that gets taken out of context, and suddenly it's, oh, there's no link between this and this, and you just kind of have to write it out, really. That you know, you can't offer a, you can't really kind of offer a rebuttal. And you can't, even when you, even when you write it out, the sky is blue. No, it's not. Yes, it yeah. is. You know, I mean, there's always, <laughs> yeah, there's always someone. Yeah. I probably need you as like my media manager, Bill. I think that's probably you, you could come in and, and that's sort of only ask. because of experience of the haters. That's all. <laughs> oh, I oh just got more more actually. time dealing with it. I'd be next time I turn up if I turn up at a Tesla event. If I'm ever allowed inside the doors, then I might need I might need you alongside me, Bill. I think <laughs> I'm more than happy to accompany you. Uh, all right. So, what's the next step? Are we are we done with the EV uh, super test for now, or or are you guys? Are you guys going to be changing anything in the way you've been testing? Was was the takeaway from this that your testing has been accurate? Or are you going to make any modifications? You think, I mean, we all need to evolve, but are you making any modifications to the way you're testing EVs? No, the straight answer is no. I mean, you're right. You know, as things evolve in the future, who knows? But right now, we feel very positive about the work that we've been doing. I don't think we're overclaiming. You know, we're not, nobody's trying to say this is perfect or anything else. What we're saying is this is a very good real world measure. And basically what we need to do now is, 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 is just test every EV as it comes in. We've tested pretty much everything. Uh, there's a handful that we need to get, need to get hold of. Uh, but as every new vehicle comes out, this becomes, you know, a key part of a key part of what we do. And, and very pleasingly, we're getting a lot of positive response from the engineering community from other OEMs and everything else. Obviously, if you do well, they love it. And if they do badly, they don't like it. But it's, but I think most people are the, the general, the general impression is that this is a really positive thing and that somebody needs to do this. And the key thing is we're trying to, it's a mix of city and highway driving. So other people are doing it, but they're doing it at fixed speeds and things like that, which isn't, you know, isn't, isn't very real or you're doing it in different parts of the country and there's too much variability. So, you know, we think we're onto something. It's absolutely what Edmunds is all about, really. It's calling out the BS. It's, you know, it's standing up to the to the big manufacturers. It's it's uh, real-world consumer advice. It's consumer first. So, yeah, no, we're committed. It's a big commitment. You know, manpower, finance, well, person power, should say, person power and, and financial firepower and everything else, it's, it's a big commitment. Um, but we're, uh, you know, we're in it for the long term. Yeah, well, that's uh, that that's good. Listen, I, I I think I think one of the takeaways here isn't really about the results of. Uh, I mean, on the on the consumer side, yes, the results of the vehicles, their range is important. But the other thing is, is you're able to sort of stand your ground and prove your point and going, hey, we believe the Edmonds test is an accurate representation for EV testing. You know, as accurate as you can get, like you said, with some variables, temperature, things like that. And the takeaway that I'm hearing is we still stand by that EV test. We don't need to really make any changes right now to that EV test. And as you bring out more cars, it's still a fairly good apples to apples test. So that's the part that I thought was the most interesting to me, right, is – if you are going to be shopping for an EV, everyone's going to have their opinion on what looks good, what's comfortable, whatever. But there's not going to be a lot of opinion on range. So why not take a look at some of the most accurate testing that's out there? And I think you guys have been nailing it. And you validated your first test. Yeah. <laughs> most yeah, importantly. So, yeah, and it's, uh, you know, it's it's, 
I, I know it's such a strange media world at the moment where there's almost a there's almost an idea that we tell you something, you write it down, and then it becomes fact. And actually, there's you know there, it's it's difficult because you know everybody's struggling, media world struggling for resource and everything else. There are great people actually actually independently testing, and you know we need to hold that. We you know it costs us a lot of money, but we you know we we hold that very dear. Well, look, if we've learned anything this past year during COVID, people have a lot of opinions about facts. <laughs> right the so, alternative truth yeah so there's a lot of that um let me tell you guys about geico you can own your home or you rent your home either way we know it can be a lot of work but you know what's easy it's bundling your policies with geico geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy and that's a good thing too because you already have so much to do around your home already so just visit geico.com to get a quote and see how much you can save it's geico easy Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Please tell me that Hummer was badass in person. And it was and, and was it as big as it looked on television? Yes and yes. So you're ah. talking about the uh the uh, the Hummer E V at Barrett Jackson, which uh all of uh all of those cars uh, the charity cars, by the way, of you know, we we talked about the hundred and five million dollars that Barrett Jackson sold. It was ninety five million in in auction cars. 5.8, 5.8 million in charity cars and uh, and f- like 4 point something million in memorabilia. But the charity cars are always exciting to do. The auctions get the, – the whole room gets very excited. Uh, you're, and, and Bear Jackson has sort of made a name for themselves on working with the manufacturers to get VIN number one. And this year they got VIN number one of the TRX, the Mustang Mach 1. The new Bronco, the Hummer EV, all awesome. They're all been number I'm one. Really fixated on that Hummer, and uh, and they got the Cadillacs, the the Black Wings, the CT4 and the CT5 V Black Wings. They got the VIN number ones of those too. So uh, they had I don't know six or so of VIN number one cars, uh, which which are great. Now normally, it, because of COVID. We're already shipping TRXs and stuff, you know, the Ram TRX. So the VIN number one is a built vehicle. You got the launch edition in that gray. But in the case of most of these cars, when you win VIN number one, you get to go and build it however you want. So like for the Hummer EV, you get VIN number one, and now you get to sit with GM and say, this is the options I want. Just assume all of them because somebody yes. paid $2 million Dubai. or $2.5 million <laughs> to buy that thing. Uh, and the, uh, I and the build- Bronco went for – it was a million bucks. Hummer went for two five, and, and and the Bronco, yeah, the Bronco was like a million dollars in change. It, yeah, I saw the Bronco. I didn't hear the end Hummer figure. That's crazy, isn't it? That the Hummer figure I was mean, was was huge. Um, uh, yes, and uh, TRX four hundred and ten thousand dollars. By the way, that's a really good number for a vehicle that's already being delivered on the showroom floors, right? Yeah. Um, the the Mustang Mach One VIN One got five hundred thousand dollars. You know, and uh, of course, that's you know, just the trim. Yeah. Do you think the? Do you think? Okay, you've been there before on Saturday night when Hendrix, uh, you know, Poteen, all those guys are bidding on those charity cars. Were they represented there, or were they on the phone? Uh, they were uh, there. So as I rolled up to Barry Jackson, I saw Rick Hendricks like empty semi truck sitting in the parking lot, getting gotcha. ready to, <laughs> to to take home whatever he's buying. So uh, awesome. although the difference was, I saw his truck with like another truck and a field of nothing. Right, it, not everybody was there. There was a lot of uh, phone bidders, of course. The Shelby Super Snake, Shelby's personal 427 twin supercharged car. That surprised uh, me. Five million dollars, um, at five point five million all in. Um, <clears throat> that was a phone bidder, I believe. Yeah, they Craig told that jumped was down on stage. He he had a few bids in, and uh, uh, and then he got outbid, and uh, uh, so it was a it was an exciting it was an exciting event. It was an exciting auction. Uh, like I said, we'll get into it a little bit more uh, yeah, I'm uh, this sorry week. To keep bringing you back. There. No, no, it's good. Um, you know, their next event, which is going to be exciting, is it's going to be in June 17 through 19, Las Vegas, uh, which they've really? done before. But 
Uh, it's going to be at the newly built, newly expanded Las Vegas, Las Vegas Convention Center, the 1.4 million square foot expansion. Um, uh, I sat with uh, some of the Barrett Jackson people. They said that we're very excited to be in there. We're expecting a big auction. Uh, a little bit of growing pains because in Scottsdale, they know where everything is, how everything works. They know, you know, uh, they've done that facility a million times. This is new. Uh, you know, so even going, hey, where do you check in? They're like, oh, let me look at the map. Let me talk to somebody. Let me get on a walkie talkie. Like there's a there's a bit of that. Uh, and uh, we're going to be doing some fun stuff with Barrett Jackson as well. We'll get into some of the details as as we lock that down. But we've got plenty of time. But I'm telling you. I will see you there. Plan, I will be there. You yeah, will be too, there. Right? You should I go, think I'm Alistair. I'm going to come to that one, Matt. I've never Please. Been. Yes, you should. We've got some exciting stuff that's going to be happening over there. Um, I'm driving my West Coast, Coast Chopper El Diablo all the way to Vegas. All right. All right. So I can put it, drive it on the stage. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. I'm kind of worried lot. about I'm worried about coming back to Vegas with you boys, though. After after eighteen months of uh, of lockdown. Yeah, well, I've already been twice. So <laughs> start investing like in Pedialyte. Yeah, right. Uh, oh. I, I went to Vegas last year at the height of lockdown. It was the weirdest experience. It was like a five star room was like twenty bucks, and there was also all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah. Well, you guys should go. It's going to be a fun event. Um, it is. In the desert in June, so get that in your head. And uh, uh, I would say start planning now. Start working on flights or transportation and hotel rooms because uh, as things are opening up, especially Vegas, it's going to open up more. And like we said, uh, auction week in Arizona was different because not all of the other auctions were happening at the same time. Vegas at that time is just the Barrett Jackson auction. And uh, in the past, I don't know, they did upwards of 100,000 people. I think they were doing $60, $70 million in sales at that auction. So to give you some perspective, you know, we just did 100, they just did 105 million now uh, in in Scottsdale over a seven day period. And previously, you know, uh, Barrett Jackson has done, you know, Sixty-eight million dollars over a three-day period, um, and uh, it'll be it'll be fun. And that beautiful new building, which we're, we're, where we expect the SEMA show to be, or SEMA is going to expand into that as as well. So, should be a should be a good event. Should be a fun event. Um, I just want to check in with you on whatever else you got going on. But let me just uh, talk about Dodge one more time. You know, Dodge has officially opened orders for the new 2021 Dodge Durango SRT Hellcat. It's the most powerful SUV ever. It'll be exclusive for 2021. I believe they're only making 2,000 units. They're all pretty much uh, accounted for, but some dealers still have them. So you might want to check it out to see if a dealer has it. It uh, has 710 horsepower. It's got a new aggressive exterior styling. It's got a new interior with a driver-centric cockpit as well. Also, all of that is on the the other V8 ones, the RT. Um, And all buyers receive a full day of pro instruction at the, I want to say, Radford? Driving Radford. School, Radford Performance Driving School, the so newly they, named. Still have some memory. Yes, uh, the Radford Performance uh, High Performance Driving School. Uh, deliveries of uh, of that SRT uh, Hellcat have already begun. So get on the list and um, call around for that. And as we mentioned, Dodge was ranked number one for initial quality and best driver appeal for mass market brands by J.D. Power. It's the first U.S. brand ever to be ranked number one in initial quality and appeal in the same year. So see your local Dodge dealer or visit Dodge.com to schedule your test drive. What's coming up new for you guys uh, over at Edmonds? Well, we're getting a Durango Hellcat in for starters. That's going to be fun. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) You see, so a bit of yin and yang, the EVs, and then the um, Durango Hellcat. Um, talking of which, actually, I did a video a couple of weeks ago with the uh, uh, with the DBX and the Urus. So that's on YouTube at the moment. So that's kind of a that's kind of a bit of fun. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We did a drag race, and we did all sorts of little challenges with it, just because. Why not? Kind of when, you get, car, when you're so testing those silly. things, when you're testing those <laughs> things, actually, uh, I have a Durango Hellcat coming in as well to test. Um, I. Hopefully I get it before you because I don't know. I've seen what you guys do to vehicles. (laughs) And uh, uh, also, 
in that same vein of of the Urus, uh, Audi is going to send a, like I, I'm going to get it wrong RS Q8 or Q8 RS. It's basically the Lamborghini yeah. Urus, but in in uh, in Audi attire. <laughs> yeah, whereas the Urus is a Lamborghini and Audi attire if you get inside it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm curious if you guys tested that yet because it seems like, and I don't know where the price point is, but I feel like the Audi is going to be the Lamborghini for, I don't know, $100,000 less money. Uh, oh, well, the Lambo we had with all the options on it was best part of 300 and well, no, it was 300 So, uh, yeah. yeah, so it'd be an Audi for half the price probably. Yeah, it probably would. And uh, for, correct me if I'm wrong, it's going to be the same engines, basically same power, or maybe, I don't know, I, it's going to be some weird Audi Lamborghini thing where the Lamborghini is like 612 horsepower and Audi is going to be like 590, right? I'm just guessing. But but, but it doesn't have a Lamborghini in like a little <laughs> plastic badge on the, or chrome badge probably on the, on the, on the dashboard. Yeah, or stitched into the headrest. Uh, uh, I have to say I love the Urus. I, I kind of, it was one of those cars, I think it's pretty vulgar and this thing was, this thing was bright green. It's not really my kind of thing, but... It was a car that I wanted to hate, but actually ended up really admiring. It's an amazing piece of engineering. Uh, yeah. How are you? What, what's your thoughts about what's going to happen with the Audi? Yeah, what's with the, I with, mean, are you excited about that one? Like, kind of like you were the Urus? Yeah, the RS. Yeah, I, 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 yeah the, I mean, the RS Q8, all those RS Audis, because they're done by separate, you know, it's like M Power, they're Contra GMBH rather than, you know, down the main line. So they're always pretty, they're always pretty special. And uh, yeah, it's, it'll be it'll be it'll be a nice be a nice thing. I I, agree. I want an RS I want an RS six actually the uh, the Avant the uh, the the fast wagon yeah That's the wagon cool. There's one park near my house it's very cool. That's the one we were talking about that last week. Yeah, uh, uh, Bill was talking about uh, starting to crush on uh, the super wagons, and you know we kind of missed the CTSV, especially with the manual. I thought Mercedes had like a really hot AMG wagon for for a minute, but uh, they still do. The yeah, E sixty three AMG. Yeah, um, and I don't know who else is out there other than uh, than than Audi, but Audi seems to be the one getting all the attention right now. With with that yeah, one. Audi and Audi and Mercedes, but uh, yeah, that RS six. That's a there's the, I said there's one parked on the road not not too far from where I live, and yeah, it's a very cool thing. Yeah, it drool looks, emoji. Yeah, it looks. There's lots of people flipping those at the moment. It seems to be, yeah. We're seeing them pop up for on. I think there was a red one on Bring a Trailer already that that sold, and um, I haven't necessarily seen it at auction yet. But uh, it, I can tell you that Audi didn't offer one to test drive, so I don't know. Maybe they just all <laughs> sold or 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 whatever. But I'd love to get into one of those. But um, uh, all right, guys, check out Edmunds.com slash road noise. You'll see all the fun stuff that these uh, guys are up to, all the fun antics and whatnot. Um, it'll be fun when you guys get that Hellcat uh, as well because, I don't know, I just like the idea of this just a batshit crazy three-row full-size SUV, zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. Uh, Dodge claims it'll run 1150s in the quarter mile. So you go test it and let us know if it does 1150s in the quarter mile. We have a lot of share doing a film about that, so um, I'll let you know when it's out. <laughs> uh, Good luck on traction. All right, guys, uh, uh, you can check uh, you can check out Alistair on uh, on Twitter. He's Alistair Weaver on Twitter. Feel free to make a gif about him and post it up there, and uh, <laughs> and uh, chime in on all your wonderful comments on Instagram as out. Well, he's Weaver on Cars. W e a v e r Weaver on Cars on Instagram and. Uh, uh, we always love having you on this show. We'll check in with you again in a few weeks as well. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. I, actually, well, I forgot to tell you, next time I'm on, I'm going to tell you about how we've had rat problems in our GT500. <laughs> it's, in the, it, it's in the shop at the moment because apparently rodents got into the engine. Seriously. Yeah, that doesn't that, come that's from the factory, next though. Time. That doesn't, that doesn't come, from, come from the factory? No, that's. I don't know where you guys are parking these things or what road trip you went on. Tesla, Tesla fanboys, put them in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably why it's the Tesla fanboys. <laughs> put them in your GT500. Listen, Take care, Alistair. Every, every, and every time you drag race the GT500, people were giving you static about it because that car is so difficult to actually launch. It's so much power, right? So where's the GT500 fanboys? Because I can't drive. Yeah, that's what they say. All right, guys, thank you so much. Well, keep, until next week, uh, keep the air in this bear and the bag in the wheel. Thank you. Boom. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast.
is a Corolla Digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit carcastshow.com.